Part 4 of Federalist 40, paragraph 12. The truth is that the great principles of the Constitution proposed by the Convention may be considered less as absolutely new than as the expansion of principles which are found in the Articles of Confederation. The misfortune under the latter system has been that these principles are so feeble and confined as to justify all the charges of inefficiency which have been urged against it and to require a degree of enlargement which gives to the new system the aspect of an entire transformation of the old. In one particular, it is admitted that the Convention have departed from the tenor of their commission. Instead of reporting a plan requiring confirmation of all the states, they have reported a plan which is to be confirmed and may be carried into effect by nine states only. It is worthy of remark that this ob objection, though the most plausible, has been the least urged in the publications which have swarmed against the Convention. The forbearance can only have proceeded from an irresistible conviction of the absurdity of subjecting the fate of 12 states to the perverseness or corruption of a 13. Remember, I showed you this fact on Federalist 40 Part 1. Let me finish this, and uh, then I'll explain some more. From the example of inflexible opposition given by a majority of one-sixtieth of the people of America to a measure approved and called for by the voice of 12 states, comprising 59 sixtieth of the people, an example still fresh in the memory of in the memory and indignation of every citizen who has felt for the wounded honor and the prosperity of this country. As this objection, therefore, has been in a manner waived by those who have criticized the powers of the Convention, I dismiss it without further observation. Here, he says, the critics are saying that this new constitution goes into effect, starts working only when nine states ratified and accepted, whereas under the old constitution, it had to be unanimous. Every state had to say yes. And Madison says exactly. This is what has been preposterous about our Articles of Confederation. Every time we want to do something important for the country, one state can stop the whole work. One state, like Rhode Island or Delaware, that are only one-sixtieth of the population of the nation. And Twelve other states have to suffer because one state doesn't want to go along. He says we had to change that. This is the craziest part of the old constitution. It is so preposterous and crazy, and he uses perverse, that he says, I don't even have to explain anything else to you anymore. The third point to be inquired into is how far considerations of duty arising out of the case itself could have supplied any defect of regular authority. In the preceding Inquiries, the powers of the Convention have been analyzed and tried with the same rigor and by the same rules as if they had been real and final powers for the establishment of a Constitution for the United States. We have seen in what manner they have borne the trial even on the supposition. It is time now to recollect that the powers were merely advisory and recommendatory, that they were so meant by the states 
and so understood by the Convention, and that the latter have accordingly planned and proposed a Constitution which is to be of no more consequence than the paper on which it was written, unless it be stamped with the approbations with the approbation of those to whom it is addressed. This reflection places the subject in a point of view altogether different and will enable us to judge with propriety of the course taken by the Convention. Let us view the ground on which the Convention stood. It may be collected from the proceedings that they were deeply and unanimously impressed with the crisis, which had led their country almost with one voice to make so singular and solemn an experiment for correcting the errors of a system by which this crisis had been produced. These people got together in the convention. These were, they loved their country. They had seen what a serious situation the country was in. So when they got together in this convention, they had to come up with the best system possible. They didn't want to sacrifice what was best for the whole population of all the states and just look at what was best for their own states or for their own community. That they were no less deeply and unanimously convinced that such a reform as they have proposed was absolutely necessary to effect the purpose of purposes of their appointment. It could not be known, it could not be unknown to them that the hopes and expectations of the great body of citizens throughout this great empire were turned with the keenest anxiety to the event of their deliberations. They have had every reason to believe that the contrary sentiments agitated the minds and bosoms of every external and internal foe to the liberty and prosperity of the United States. They had seen in the origin, they had seen in the origin and progress of the experiments the alacrity with which the proposition made by a single state, Virginia, towards a partial amendment of the Confederation had been attached to and promoted. They had seen the liberty assumed by a very few deputies from a very few states convened at Annapolis of recommending a great and critical object, wholly foreign to their commission, not only justified by the public opinion, but actually carried into effect by 12 of the 13 states. Twelve of the 13 states showed up at the convention in Philadelphia. Rhode Island was the only state that did not send any delegates. So 12 out of 13 states obviously found it so important that they sent delegates to work on this important project and give us a constitution. Continues, they had seen in a variety of instances, assumptions by Congress, not only of recommendatory, but of operative powers, warranted in the public estimation by occasions and objects infinitely less urgent than those by which their conduct was to be governed. They must have reflected that in all great changes of established government, forms ought to give way to substance that a rigid adherence in such cases to the former would render nominal and nugatory the transcendent and precious right of the people to establish and alter their governments as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Look, he's quoting from the Declaration of Independence. He says, we said in the Declaration of Independence that people have a right to establish a government for their happiness, for their future happiness, for the future generations. So he says, we had to 
remember that. We had to remember that. And when, when situation arose, we had to step up and do what's best for the whole country. And that is extremely important. He says, do you want us to sacrifice the population of the United States, 59, 60th of the population of the United States, to what's best for 1 60th of the United States, to the people of one little bitty state? So he says, think about it. 